Hello, this is Damien Marie Adho, and I am an axiological atheist, which can be simply understood as a value theory or a value science atheist. Or put another way, I am an axiologist, which is a value theorist, and I am an atheist. And I come from that axiological standpoint. So I'm going to give you the culmination of my uh, endeavor as an atheist, and that is to understand the evolution of a religion. So, here we go. Here's my presentation on understanding religion evolution. Animism, totemism, shamanism, paganism, and progressed organized religion. And this is my hypothesized uh, evolution structure. It was from one thing building on to another. Basically, everything kind of starts in anism, and all things, in a sense, are a version of anism plus other ideas. So, in this picture you see here, uh, which is uh, uh, my art, and all the um, pictures you're going to see are going to be all my art also, and my ideas. But uh, let me explain some of the imagery, you know, in this picture. So, first, you have to understand, to me, religion is an evolved product. The interconnectedness of religious thinking is the issue. So, to me, in a general way, um, it all starts um, with anism, which to me could be encapsulated as the idea of the theoretical belief in supernatural powers, spirits, you know, then um, these things are physically, um, in a sense, uh, encapsulated, you know, uh, and expressed or in a physical way, you know, with totemism. And so animism, I see, is about 100,000 years or older, likely older. And then totemism is about 50,000 years old, possibly older also. So totemism, to me, is the theoretical belief in the mystical relationship between powers, spirits, through the use of a totem. And it also can be the totem is an expression in a sense almost like language and that it's telling a story or ideas, not just a simple single idea. So then I think that um, as time went on, you know, this uh, also elicited a full-time specific person in a sense to do this worship or believe interacting, you know, in the spirit realm. And to me, that's when you start to see shamanism. And it's, all this is a, just like a loose, um, quick, you know, definition to helping people understand. And so I see uh, shamanism as the theoretical belief in the access and influence of spirits through ritual. And... Then, to me, it's um, further employment of myths and deities, or gods, goddesses, are added to the above um, mentioned things. So, this belief in spirits, the belief in, in some physical representation of the spirit world, or something to do with the spirit world, and then a practitioner, in a sense, you know, that's actually uh, designated for this uh, endeavor. Um, which, of course, all these I, I don't believe in as an atheist, but I'm just explaining the thinking. So to me, when you add all those up and then you add a little bit more in-depth um, background story, myths, whatever, deities, to me, then, then you're, you're giving it the expression that we call, to me, paganism. And not that I'm saying there's an distinctly, uh, in any of these things I've mentioned, you know, a definite defining, and these are overarching, like, influences. So to me, paganism, in this sense, often is a lot more nature-based in, in its mentality of religion, you know, than the religions that then preceded. You know, then also, most of the current religions, to me, even though in a sense they I see them as branching out of paganism, to me, I think paganism, organized religion, to me, is a little bit different than paganism, generally, to me. Anyways, thus... Um, when we get to this point, though, we're hitting close to the link to more, you know, ancient, organized religious thinking. 
that it stems from. And that's the issue that I'm trying to show in understanding the evolution of religion is that these things are all in a sense grouped together in, in a linkage that um, needs to be understood. So my hypothesis expressed, you know, in this, um, you know, material I'm going to um, show you. And to me, it's, it's building on top of each other on the facts. And it comes to that that must be the conclusion that is the most reasonable. And so to me, it's understanding that religion is evolved product. I hear some people um, talk about it as some kind of an innate thing in humans. I, I don't think it's any more innate than saying a shovel or a hammer or a bow and arrow or a spear is somehow an innate thing. You know, it's a product. It's something that humans have produced. And so, yes, I also think that to me, in a sense, if you look at the progression, it's almost like it's fear given wings. It's the desire, the fear of the, in the sense of death, like the first things. And then, then the, the fear of the lack of control, I see more as totemism. And then shamanism, I see um, as the feeling of wanting to, to be more, in a sense, connected to the world and uh, um, not just controlled by it, you know, in a sense, more active uh, belief in the active participation of humans, which we can intentionally do stuff, but there's no magic. And then to me, paganism is, is the culmination of this fear into the to uh, a more um, fixed setting, especially because I believe it came out of uh, agriculture. And uh, when we started depending on a fixed place, sedatism, the fact that we stayed one place, you know, means that we end up with a limited, in a sense, resource. You know, or if we have a, a good resource, others with limited resources then will want to come and take the, the resource that someone else has. So anyways, it seems that um, ancient people had to survive, you know, may, amazing threats, you know, even that, in a sense more than we, in a, you know, currently do on a, on a global level now. Uh, in, in a sense, they're in a dangerous universe, you know, and so the, the belief in superstition, the good and evil in a sense, I see at that point is the desire to... Um, try to classify things so that we can navigate and understand the world. But the problem is, when people don't have information, the superstition can just seep in as an answer. And so, human, uh, you know, immorality or imperfection, you know, is given this, or lack of good or evil, in a sense, this imperfection is given this thing called a soul that then is supposedly carries off after death and affects you know the ways of the world of the living you know which was thought to um still affect the living you know even to this day and but this this still to me in a sense stems from a kind of ancestor worship and so but ancestors doesn't always have to be your personal ancestors i mean look at how um in a sense america we look back at our founding fathers or whatever our ancestors and they're not you know um, ancestors to us but in a sense they're almost like a clan ancestor and that's what I mean by the ancestor worship often to me stems from that kind of a place and then as it gets more and more removed you end up more and more sacredizing even human beings and then they turn into you know the belief uh, that they become gods or whatever but all this starts with the, with the belief that there's a soul because if you have no soul then there's nothing to leave the body, then there is no nothing to worship in a sense other than just a dead person. So this ancestor worship presumably to me led to the belief in supernatural beings or, you know, something of the kind, supernatural something or in a sense or magical something. And then uh, some of these were then turned into the belief in deities. And uh, this feeble myth called gods, goddesses, whatever, deities, um, it's just a human conceived, you know, product. It's, it's, it's a term that in a sense is made from nothing, it doesn't go into anything other than just myth or claim, you know, and, and it's this regurgitation of, of nothingness stated over and over again. Somehow they believe changing again and again, it takes on all kinds of evolved characteristics. It leaves them, it picks them up, 
you know, and it just keeps evolving this concept of gods. All the while, they still think somehow it's special, somehow it's true, and somehow you can give your own interpretation and everyone else can disagree, but yet still somehow it's true. Unbelievable, the lack of non-thinking that's involved to me in the concept of like gods and supernatural anything. Once you really think about it, it lacks all justification. But it is just supernatural, of course, animistic spirit belief perceived as sacred. And um, so it, it it's all starts in a general way, like I said, going back to animism, which is, in a sense, a theoretical belief in supernatural powers or spirits. But then, like I said, it moved on and to other things and so you know the, the point is let's make it simple right so my hypothesis expressed that these things building on each other are within developed into what we consider religions today you know and uh shamanism to, so I'll, I'll go back so animism i believe is a hundred thousand years old or older totemism is at least to me fifty thousand years or older Shamanism, 30,000 years or older. Paganism, I think it's about 12,000 years or older. And uh, progress organized religions, to me, are about 5,000 years or older. But, like I said, let's make this simple. Atheism, or the lack of the supernatural belief position about gods, you know, is the reality position because there's nothing evident in reality to give justification for the belief in gods. So, that would mean that theism is an anti-reality position. Whether or not you think it's true, the position of the god something that you are professing is not evident in this world. It's not evident in this reality. Thus, it is a non-reality belief or an anti-reality position to be a theist to me. I don't need religion or its fake gods. You know, I am will to power and so are you. All you need to do is simply stop believing that which is not evident in reality. So this also brings me to the understanding for people that there's, to me, at least, there's an amount of universalities that are present in religion. So research concerning religion based on cognitive psychology, neuroscience, cultural anthropology, and archaeology are beginning to reach, you know, a real maturity and the number of generalizations that we can now uh, see and derive from the archaeological evidence and the anthropological and, you know, the ethnography of the areas that they're, you know, um, from that still have stories, you know, we get to, to me, start to see some of the universalities, some of these connected animistic thinking, totemistic thinking, shamanistic thinking, and paganistic thinking, that are still present in the religions of the world today. You know, and there's just something that you can sense and see in, this, in all modern religion systems. And these shared religion belief systems, you know, are to me best explained by looking back and delving deep into the evolutionary origins and the sense of religion when it comes to how this human-made product was expressed. These universals include things like the cosmos and living creatures having some kind of inherent worth and religious and, you know, other types of preservations of mystical whatever, you know, nonsense are intricately linked to individuals and communities, you know, uh, having a responsibility towards the environment. So a lot of them would say you should do this or you should do that. They all seem to have an, uh, um, an influence world system of supernatural agency. That's somehow like animism, that the, the world does have magic. It's a, I hear people tell me, well, there has to be something because I feel there has to be something. Well, there isn't anything, and that's evident in reality. There is no supernatural agency, anything. Not any science test has ever demonstrated this. 
So the, the, the supernatural agency infused belief is that humanity is somehow spiritually linked, whatever that word means, to and affected by the cosmos or some sort of thing in the, in the universe. You know, and individuals that maintain, you know, this do it with, because really I believe social relationships. The problem is, is they take social relationship or social pair bonding and then they melt it or they blend it with supernatural agents that are not reality. And they, I believe, really start to make a problem because they start to make the unreal somehow to them real. And individuals generally entertain these type of ideas or doing it with an anthropomorphic, you know, um, expression. And so when I mean anthropomorphic, I'm saying human-centered, human-like, human characteristics, human qualities, because you know why? It's humans make it. You know, so we, our fingers, in a sense, our thinking is all over it, you know. And uh, these um, expectations of the supernatural agents, you know, uh, the minds of supernatural agents, you know, are implicitly expected to function like our own thinking, like our own, you know, um, even though uh, this is at odds with our, you know, in a sense, belief about a God, because we're believing a God is nothing like us. And then you look and they act and jealous and whatever and anger and hate. And they have a lot of the same very human characteristic. <clears throat> so it's really important to see the, the, the real contradiction in the sense. You say a God is so different and so non-human, so non-moved by, by our emotional whims in a sense. And yet you see the expressions of God's being extremely emotional and human. You know, and it really goes back to uh, uh, wanting to, what I see as pair bonding. It's ancestor worship. These gods, these are part of us. That's why people take such a, I feel, a strong position like, that's my god. Because it's part of the family, or Jesus, or Mohammed. You know, you're talking to about a family member to them. Not that that's reasonable to me. It's just that, that I see what, what's happening psychologically. You know, and, and I believe that in a sense that that kind of a psychological thing is inherently human. So it's not the, the, that inherently humans have to believe in myths. It's just that humans have a tendency to want to pair bond and want to grab ideas and make them part of themselves because I believe it adds to our safety and comfort. So individuals are usually willing to subscribe to religious norms. You know, they usually do it of their own social group or ones that they somehow admire. So it really isn't about truth. It's not like you find people you absolutely hate, but yet you still know it's true. See, I, I can dislike someone and still believe that their ideas are true and not like them. But often, really, to me, it's more about, and you see this too, because even Christians will go to the church they like. You know, that, that pastor who's reading the same Bible as the other pastor Somehow this one makes you feel better because it's more motivational or or more challenging or, you know, some other sort of inspirational something or believe something. You know, and to me, these are largely, you know, uh, implicit, unconscious, you know, underlying beliefs, you know, are this animism, totemism, shamanism, paganism. And it's all through, you know... Uh, how we concern, you know, um, religions today. You know, religions, to me, it really has to be made clear, is just nothing special. It's no more than your belief in a sports team or whatever. And in general, religious belief is largely a geography issue, and not because of some kind of inherent truth that one religion has over another. This is evident in how 73% of the world's religionists, the people that believe in religions, live in countries in which their religious persuasion makes up the majority of the population. And this was demonstrated in a Pew Research study. And so you need to stop thinking that you are somehow, if you were a believer, you know, blessed to be born into the one true religion, you know, so your religion is true by birth. So that moves us right along, though, because I want to start is how did we get to animism? 
Well, to me, how we got to animism is actually pre-animism. Animism. And so pre-animism is, is at least 300,000 years old, possibly 500,000 years old. Or, who knows, older. Anyways, to me, at some point, the uh, Homo erectus uh, seemed to be uh, basically gathering um, rocks. And uh, on here, you can see there's a little face, and here's another face. And these are all faces, in a sense. They, they would gather these rocks, and putting to... They would gather these rocks, um, and they, by the way, they weren't as, I, I made it like he's sitting on it. It was not that big. They were like, you know, little pebbles, almost the size of your hand. I just drew them like this so that they were uh, more interesting for the art. But um, the thing you need to understand for me is that a, a lot of these had one eye open, one eye closed, or just one eye closed, like this one doesn't even have a, another eye. But it's uh, several of them had a, an eye closed. To me, uh, not only is the anthropomorphic face of a human, in a sense, that these rocks they were collecting or modifying to make them more human-looking, um, they also, uh, to me, uh, simplify some sort of uh, extra expression. To uh, my personal opinion, I think why I think it, the preism has some validity. Animism is because I think that. Uh, it possibly has to do with death. The eye closing is that sleeping or death. And so the fact that one eye open, one eye closed, I, I could see is probably life and death. Like, you know, it's an expression of... And uh, I don't know why there is, some of them have two eyes open. I don't know. But um, I, I think that there's at least enough where you see a symbolism. And if nothing else, they certainly were doing anthropomorphic, um, humanistic... Or human, you know, um, expressed ideas because they're they're collecting things that have faces on them, and then also um, the Tantan figure right here, this um, is supposed Venus, which I don't think is anything of the kind, but uh, I think this um, is just a representation that shows you the anthropomorphic thinking that they're personifying and looking for, because this rock also is half, you know. Um, in this shape to begin with, in a sense, and then a little bit modified or possibly modified somehow. So, uh, the, but the, but there there this is uh, about five hundred thousand to I think four hundred thousand or something like that years old. And so this right here though shows you this is before three. <laughs> so let's just say it's five, even five to three or something. Still three hundred thousand. So still this this is it shows. <laughs> This is not a one-off. It's not like they found one thing and then I'm just assuming that there was some sort of a large thing. I'm not saying this was also super wide expressed, but still, there, it, there is an obvious expression. And this is really interesting, too. It's in a sense, the Homo erectus, you know, they now, I, I saw a thing that said that they were actually able to have uh, some form of rudimentary speech. And a lot of people believe that it is speech that is necessary for actually um, transmitting religion. So in the to top here, I made a rock as kind of like a ghost or a spirit. But to me, I'm not exactly sure what they thought about this. They may have just had a rock and, and to just like a um, gravestone or something and not really a full spirit belief. I'm not, I would say they're obviously thinking something there that matters about death and stuff, I believe, or humans and, sent, you know, having some specialness or something. But I'm not, I don't think that it had a full um, thing. So, um, to me, uh, pre-animism, you know, in anthropology, is a stage of religious development supposed to have preceded animism, in which material objects were believed to contain a spiritual or supernatural energy, essence, something. Okay, and, but um, I consider this, to me, um, primal religion. Primal religion to me is basically the stage of pre-anism slash maybe anism, or at least the uh, uh, um, pre-anism or the divergence into anism at least involve I think burial or some kind of a thoughts of an afterlife or value uh, um, of the person after they die, and it may have been transferred from Homo erectus to Neanderthals. Who are also, in a sense, arcane, you know, form of humans um, when they bred with them, 
in a sense, and you see that some of the Neanderthal, um, you know, uh, stone tools, in a sense, uh, you know, could have been um, transferred from the uh, Homo erectus, anyways, or somehow developed together. Anyways, uh, Neanderthals also, remember, bred with um, not just Homo erectus, which is the upright man, you know, uh, upright walking man, excuse me, but also Homo habilis, you know, the tool, you know, using man, and it possibly others, which means they could have possibly learned some of these pre-animism ideas from one of them, or maybe multiple, or from all of them, I don't know. You know, that were expressed, you know, as a possible anthropomorphic art, you know, uh, expression like I'm demonstrating here, you know, that could have related to some sort of a, a I think, the beginning of ancestor veneration, possibly. You know, and uh, the earliest, you know, European uh, hominid crania associated with alluvian hand axes are at the sites um, in um, uh, I can't remember how to pronounce it, uh, but <laughs> Acapetur Sima des Los Herelios or something I don't know, and and uh, Sima Coma I don't know, I'm sorry I don't pronounce these well. Anyways, dating to around 500 to 400 thousand years ago. And these fossils, these fossils, excuse me, uh, and cranium belong to uh, Neanderthal crania. And, um, but there also is, um, at Ergo, hominids um, have been attributed to some of the incipient stages of Neanderthal evolution to the Heidel, Homo heidelbergus, or subspecies of Homo erectus. A recently discovered crania um, uh, found in Portugal was dating to 436,000 to 390 years ago. And it provides important evidence to the earliest European alluvian bearing hominids. Alluvian is a type of, uh, in a sense, stone tools. And bearing hominids as well as could show a transfer of those ideas between um, those species. So Homo erectus, upright walking man, lived between 1.89 million years ago to a hundred, at least, 143,000 years ago. Whereas early African Homo erectus fossils, sometimes called Homo erasure, are the oldest known early humans, or early arcane humans to have possessed modern human-like attributes. The earliest evidence of hearths or campfires occurred during the time range of the Homo erectus. While we have evidence that the hearths were used for cooking, probably also involved sharing food, I would most likely assume, they are likely to have been places also of social interaction including, you know, the invention of religious ideas and superstitions. And they also use fire for warmth, you know, to stay, you know, uh, warm and from large predators. So there's more than one use. But it's just they already were having this technology, so they already were, were utilizing, in a sense, science in a small way. So, to me, uh, pre-anism, you know, which may have included, I believe, you know, fire sacredizing or, and or worship as part of maybe its magical elements. Anyways, Neanderthals used fire at least 400,000 years ago. And there is evidence of a 300,000-year-old campfire from Israel that not... Um, not that surprising, though, after human ancestors have controlled fire from about 1.5 million years ago to at least by 300,000 years ago, like I'm saying here for anism, and of course beyond. The benefits of fire are not only to cook food and defend off predators, which they does do, 
but it also extends in a sense today. It adds to the, the ability for community bonding. By how fire, you know, even in the middle of the darkness, you know, um, the flames can excite people, you know, and seem magical and stimulating. And possibly even inspiring, you know, some of the uh, beliefs and spirits, or like fire is believed to be in a sense alive and animate. And this also to me has to do with possibly, you know, even sun worship. And really interesting about fire and sun worship is to me that they, they, they really, it's to me they have a same animistic thinking about what's going on. So, but I don't think that we need to understand that it's not like, I, I believe, just a recent thing that humans invented. No, no. Worshipping things like fire, the sun, whatever, or being have, feeling it special, you know, uh, just isn't even limited to humans. We see these in the fact that there is sun-worshipping baboons who rise early to catch the African sunrise, and they race each other to the top of this, uh, you know, cliff, for the best spots to view the sunrise. And thus we might rightly ponder how much did fire-sized tales aid in this socio-cultural religious transformations and or evolution. You know, just think in the dark, under the flickering lights, you know, of the uh, fire, you know, both, you know, above and below, you know, the core of the fire and the flames, you know, licking up into the sky, in a sense, you know, can add a feel, feeling of wonder, fear, majesty. And this is even including a superstition that as, as, as me, you know, or us as a, um, an advanced species that knows fire is not magic, fire can still have a very alluring, you know, like why people like candles and fireplaces and stuff like that. It, it just, I think it goes back to the, our, our, feeling of this majesty that it has, or superstition about it. And I think that this was then it possibly expanded and, you know, added to, and it further, you know, imaged this into possibly religion, or certainly one part of it. You know, and it would seem that superstition was expanded upon, and expanded upon until it became a religious thing. And then it was Further given these images and these ideas, you know, both heavenly lights flickering just like the fire and sacred eye specialness, just like people think fire that it has these abilities of doing, you know, which does not seem, you know, that it's too far off. And if you look at this, there was a researcher who spent 40 years studying Africa Bushmen who gathered evidence and importance and realized the importance that they have for gathering around nighttime campfires. You know, and what's really interesting is that usually um, campfires in general, um, the universality that is applicable for bonding and social information, you know, and shared emotions, and the feeling that, that all you're around a close fire it can be like a bonding thing. And in fire-sized tales, you know, you could have the correlation and the invention, in a sense, or promotion of prehistoric ancestors. You know, then they might have, you know, just think of the people back, you know, at the time of um, pre anism and stuff, that they, sitting around a fire, not really understanding the world at all. <laughs> you know, and but look at even the Bushmen today, currently, you know, have us live in a similar way of being very close to nature. You know, and although we cannot directly peer into the past of these, you know, Homo erectus, you know, we can, in the sense, of the, look at the, to the current, you know, indigenous Bushmen. And these people do live in a way that, you know, is not that different from our ancient ancestors, how that we lived, in a sense, for 99% of our evolution as humans. Therefore, we can somewhat draw some reasonable parallels such as how daytime conversations for the Bushmen are focused mainly on social relationships with a small percentage of stories. Whereas, when evening comes, the conversations around the campfire are more centered on storytelling, especially adding stories about spirit world or other worlds. So there's real mythology and fantasy. Adding possible 
credence to the thinking that nighttime darkness, full of fear and wonder, with the flickering lights of the fireside, allowed more of a magical thinking and superstitious tales to be put into the environment of the thinking. And this can, I think, produce, you know, the added element that was, in a sense, sparked, or could have sparked, the social, cultural, resolution, um, transformation, or religious evolution, beginning in the pre-animism. And the importance also is of water, you know, along with fire. And instead of, in a sense, human hidden factors that we seek out and we see as special. Many people see the touching of water or being, you know, baptized. It's just water does something just like fire purifies or whatever. It just, it's just goes back to these real basic involving these many religious themes currently that are really lingering, primitive to me, primitive ancestor, animism, you know, that is still seen in current religions today. You know, fire as sacred or magic can seem, you know, all-consuming fires. You know, people talk about volcanoes, lightning as gods, their power, their vengefulness, their holy fire. Fire is a means of transformation, magical purification, or just magical being in itself. All of which, of course, is fantasy world, nonsense, non-reality thinking. But as well as this fire worship, or worship of the sun, or punishment, hell, lake of fire, which could, in a sense, be a mixing of fire and water, if only symbolically, you know, used, and they're believed to be used, or believed to be connected to ceremonies, like bonfires, eternal flames, sacred candles, incense, lights, lamps that are left on for a sacred purpose or a special, you know, believed purpose. It's just to me animism. And these are some of the forms that you incorporate, you know, into many faiths. And there's fire worship, and let me just list a few religions that have fire worship. Judaism. Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Sikhism, Baliism, Shintoism, Totemism, sorry, Taoism, etc. All this worship of fire slash sun are hardly special. And they're not even contained to us. They're seen in primates worshipping even thunderstorms or fires or sunrises as I talked about before. So we have, in a sense, forgotten how nature worship, animistic superstitionism, animistic somethingism, or animistic supernaturalism is present in today's religions. The mega religions that we have today, you know, think that they're so far removed from this animistic, you know, or pre anism thinking, but they're not. They're simply an evolved form of it. Their rituals, their beliefs, their prayers have a connection to animism, nature worship, but are more hidden or sometimes stylized. But don't confuse the burning of candles, the worship of fire. It is a relatively, in the most sense, the same thing. And then you ought to also ask, you know, like these things are, you know, are they just art or really some form of animistic, you know, vener ancestor veneration? So for me, pre-anism ideas in rock art, as we we're talking about earlier, like this here and 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 here. Um... Okay, it, it, it's related to a kind of, to me, and ancestor veneration, I hypothesize, which may have involved magical thinking of some kind. And it stems from a social or non-religious function of ancestor veneration is possible. And, and I think it's some of the motivation is the, you know, 
the, the cumulative or the cultural kinship values, you know, the family bonding or the social bonding values, you know, just think of such as, you know, uh, familial, you know, loyalty, familial, you know, in a sense, piety or love, you know, and, and the, the desire to continue the family's lineage. This is a strong thinking, I think. And, and the ancestor veneration occurs in societies with every degree of social, political, and te technological complexity, and yet still happens. So I'm not saying that it, that when I say these are arcane in a sense origins, well, they're used today. It's just that their origins are arcane. I don't, I'm not saying that somehow lesser people believe those. All people that believe non-reality are believing non-reality. And to me, non-reality is not justified, and thus it's not reasonable to have as a belief. So, you have to understand, to me, these ancestors, you know, um, veneration or worship, uh, to me, is not that different. Just another version that we now have as deities or, you know, some other um, special uh, magical people people or beings like Jesus, Muhammad, whatever, you're sacralizing these people. So in some sense, um, the uh, Afro-despotic uh, uh, cultures, uh, ancestors, are seen as being able to um, in intercede on behalf of the living, you know, uh, often with messengers between humans and gods, deities, spirits, whatever, as spirits who um, were once human themselves, is what they believe, they, have, um, they are seen as being better able to understand human needs than would be a supposed divine, godly being that was not, in a sense, from um, ever human. This reminds me even of Jesus, like somehow you can understand better because he was supposedly human for a while. In other cultures, though, not, not African, uh, the purpose of ancestor veneration is not to ask for favors, but one's duty. Some cultures believe that their ancestors actually need to be provided for by their descendants. And their practice includes offerings of food, and other provisions. And I think this is also seen in uh, early uh, animism grades, the belief that they needed food or trinkets or gifts or, or something to take to the afterlife. And uh, although there is no generally accepted theory concerning the origin of ancestor veneration, the social phenomenon appears in some form in all, in a sense, human cultures documented, um, or at least it seems so far. So um, there also is a claim, you know, that ancestor veneration might have served some sort of a group um, coordination role during, during the early human evolution. And thus, it might have been more of a me mechanism that led to re religious representation, you know, fostering, uh, in a sense, the desire for group cohesion. Let's all mourn this person. I know you're hurting. I'm hurting with you. Here, let's make a thing make you feel better. Let's, you know, here's this rock with a face. It's Johnny or, or Jeff or whoever or Sally. Or, you know. So to me, I think it's um, intentional burial really demonstrates this, particularly with grave goods, signifying it's some sort of a concern for the dead and a concern even that they need to be um, cared for after death. Neanderthals and the Simps were one of the main first human species or arcane human species to practice uh, burial behaviors, certainly to practice them on a wide scale. And um, the intentionality, they would actually bury their dead. So um, doing so, though, in shallow graves, you know, but along with, you know, stone tools, animal bones, other, you know, some uh, red ochre, um, sim you know, symbol symbolic things. And so uh, there's a lot of um, uh, great sites, you know, like Sindar, um, Iraq, and Kabara Cave in Israel. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. And 
Caparina in Corsica. <clears throat> the earliest undisputed human burials, though, human, I mean, as in current, more modern humans, um, not, not Neanderthals, back, uh, dates back to about 100,000 years ago, with remains stained with red ochre, just like the Neanderthals before them, showing a ritual intentionality similar to that of the Neanderthals that did it before them. So now we move right along to animism. Animism is approximately a 100,000-year-old belief system. To me, in a sense, animism is a more holistic and feminine in its nature of things, even in the nature of how it even views negative things, like uh, tricksters or benevolent spirits or benevolent things. Um... It also, to me, uh, sees nature as somewhat productive or helpful, not just negative. And to me, that there is uh, spirits, or there are spirits and supernatural beings, both to, to an animist, both animals and human, as well as non-human supernatural things or beings. But in general, would attribute to some sort of a personal ancestor, like grandmother spirit, grandfather spirit, or great grandmother great grandfather spirit almost like in mother earth it's like mother earth spirit or great grandmother earth spirit or something and it's not so much of what we think of as a deity or a god in a sense today you know animism um from latin emina breath spirit life uh, is a religious belief that objects place creatures all possess or even plants all possess a distinct spiritual essence Potentially, animism perceives all things, animals, plants, rocks, rivers, or can, doesn't mean it have to perceive every single thing, but can perceive all things, animals, plants, rocks, rivers, water systems, even say clouds possibly, you know, um, as in a sense, even human, in a sense, handiwork or things perhaps, you know, is animated as alive, like I said about fire, as being somehow a thing in itself. And animism is one of the oldest, to me, types of belief systems in the world and predates um, a lot of the uh, religious ideas. And so thus, you know, it's um, somehow connected or is the origin of, or at least to me. And it, it, it is still practiced, though, in, in a wide variety of forms in a lot of, you know, um, traditional societies or, you know, primitive sort of, you know, societies or older societies in a sense. And animism is used in anthropology of religion as a term for the belief system of many indigenous tribal peoples, especially in contrast to the relatively more recent developed organized religions that we think of today. Although each culture, in a sense, has its own different mythologies and rituals, animism is said to describe the most common functional uh, thread of indigenous peoples, their belief in spiritual or supernatural or superstitious perspectives, which of course are false. An animistic perspective is so widely held and inherent to most animistic indigenous peoples that they often do not even have a word for their in their language to correspond to animism or even religion itself. The term is, in a sense, an anthropological construct. So, animist is a belief in spirit-filled life and or afterlife. In a sense, you are a hidden animist if you believe so. And that belief goes back to approximately a 100,000-year-old belief system. And we see it in Israel with the oldest intentional burial at 100,000 years ago of 15 individuals covered with red ochre in Border Cave. We also have intentional burial. At, at, um, it's in South Africa, or Southern Africa, I should say. Intentional burial of an infant with red ochre and uh, shell ornament. Possibly... Um, extending to or from you know the the did neanderthals teach us this primitive animism uh, and i think it's possible 
at 120,000 years ago, that seems to be some correlation. As they, uh, too, used red ochre, and well, it seems that Neanderthals may have transmitted, possibly to me, this primal animistic religion, or at least the, the, the belief in intentional burial, or thoughts possibly on, through, on afterlife in some animistic way, it seems to express or be perceived as this primal type of animistic religion, which to me, from the, uh, if you look at what the Neanderthals did, you know, uh, it could have come from them first because they were doing intentional burial at about, you know, 250,000 years ago. And they you were you definitely using red ochre on their burials from about 230,000 years ago. And they also would have, by that time, had grave goods. And it just clearly has to be some sort of an animistic thinking or belief in an afterlife or ancestor worship or something. So I think the idea of that Neanderthals, who may have, to me, transmitted a primal religion anism or pre-anism, is not as crazy as you, when you think, as then you consider this, it appears Neanderthals also were religious. They actually built um, some sort of a underground circles at 175,000 years ago. And it's thought by some it was some sort of a cathedral or religious arrangement, or possibly a place of worship. And evidence also suggests that Neanderthals were the first intent, uh, humans, in a sense, to, especially on a large scale, to intentionally bury the dead. And, do, and like I said, they're doing so in small things. You know, um, and, and also, Neanderthals ha, um, had possibly it transmitted to them. You know, because if you look at the earliest burial itself, or potential burial, is that 350,000 years ago, where you have, a, a, in a sense, a red or uh, pink stone axe that is unused, dropped on top of a pit with 27 Homo heidelbergus, almost as in a, um, like a large mass grave with a um, reminder stone or something, as well as the fact that the oldest... Stone Age art dates to, in a sense, to 500,000 to 233,000 years ago. And it could have been possibly, you know, a female representation, even with magically bleak qualities. Now, I don't think it was a goddess uh, or one of these Venus things, but um, in a sense, it was found in Israel. And in a sense... Uh, I think, though, it, it's demonstrating this animistic or pre-animistic, you know, convergence, or certainly the possibility of it. And if you see that they're uh, um, uh, moving around the fire, so since fire worship, you know, is part of, the, I think, um, still part of animism. But it, I think that fire adds that magical or that, in a sense, almost alive, just like the sun rays or so and I think that music and dance, you know, in a sense before, you know, really writing, you know, you have a lot more um, of these people having to share ideas or it doesn't really get shared. And just think, so you could add one religious thinking and that person dies off and then, then some, either someone else comes or nothing happens for a while until someone else thinks of it. So then we're moving on to uh, totemism and uh to me, um, you can see already there's a little bit different in, uh, up in the sky. Uh, their belief, I think, about the world is a little bit different than the animist. And this right here I see is the, um, the thing that then, uh, to me, becomes um, uh, uh, the uh, deities. It's, it's, in a sense, I see it as the clan ancestor or almost like an archetype ancestor where they're not really an ancestor. It's like a myth about an ancestor, sort of, <laughs> that then I think later then becomes more removed from ancestor and just becomes a, a myth and a god. 
So anyways, um, if you see here that he's holding a female figurine, uh, a, a possible, you know, um, magic, uh, hunting magic or something. I don't think that at 50,000 years ago, I don't think these uh, female figurines, which this one uh, is not that old, but not 50,000, but uh, figurines in general were not, um, I don't think deities came until paganism to me. But let's say, so totemism to me is a little less holistic than animism. And unlike animism's more female nature to me, I see uh, totemism as, as a little more uh, male-centric or male in nature, masculine in nature, especially compared to animism. Um, with its highly or heavily supported taboos and laws in a sense or structures or uh, clan structures, this is us, that's them, we're better, they're not, or they're good, or you know, just a classification uh, on a more... Um, extensive level in the religion itself and things um i have to be separate and have to be uh the the belief in the sacred and the profane you know the off limits of the allowed and the clean and the unclean and that it starts becoming something that's in, in running in the entire part of the person's lives to me and so uh things uh, in nature are to be in a sense co controlled and feared or utilized uh, and uh, things in nature have, in a sense, a danger and can, in a sense, be evil or harmful or bad or, or should not be done. And this also can, um, things can be used for good, can be helpful or protection. So there are spirits, in a sense, in, in this belief, too, that are um, made, uh, in a sense, um, different uh, than anism in their uh shape and their uh, metaphorical uh, clan ancestor and there's also to me uh, supernatural beings though I don't think that they're um, godlike but they are both animal and human like just like in animism because in a sense this is animism plus you know an extra belief in a sense of physical uh, expression and uh, um, separation of, of things you know, but um, there are animism animals that are, in a sense, calmer or less harmful, you know, like birds uh, um, or a stork, you know, uh, referencing life and snakes that are smiling in, in animism. So you have more of a, the different birds in a sense, I feel like this, this is just a, a general, I'm not saying that it has to be this, I'm just saying in general, the expression of animism. I see is a little more like peaceful and it's a little more aggressive with totemism to me, a little more harmful based or the belief in the harmful, you know, cause in totemism, you know, you have the same similar templates of ideas, but they're changed a little bit, even though they're similar to anism In totemism verge is a vulture compared to, you know, I would say, you know, the animism, um, uh, being focusing on, you know, the bird of life. I would just say this one, the sense of bird of death, a vulture. Referencing things of death, you know, and not life, you know. And the snake uh, up here is, you know, unlike animism, a little more neutral. This is more of a threat. Teeth are out. And uh, so I see that they see that to me that the supernatural world a little more like that. A little more um, threat back and forth. But... Not that anism doesn't have demons and spirits and stuff, because it does, but in some of it. But I'm just saying that in general, it's, it's, you can see there's a little bit of a difference. And uh, like anism also, you know, in totemism, you know, there is non-human, in a sense, supernatural things, beings. But in general, they, they're not, to me, what I, we would consider totally, you know, like deities and gods. They're attributed as somewhat non-personal shared clan ancestor like i was saying before you know with animism the grandmother grandfather or great grandmother great grandfather not as much as we think about gods today totemism is a system of belief in which humans are said to have a kinship or a mystical relationship with spirit beings such as an animal plant an entity whatever or a totem 
is thought to interact with a given kin group or an individual and serves as their emblem or symbol. And the term totemism has been used to characterize a cluster of tastes in religion, which I'm not trying to say that when I use the term, it's meaning all of the meanings ever been offered. I'm, I'm using everything at more of a simple level, just the main template is what I'm talking about. So uh, totemism manifests in various ways, forms, types, in different contexts, and in um, is most often found among population with, you know, tr traditional economies, ceremonies, beliefs, and it's uh, often relied to more hunter-gathering communities, you know, than fixed farming and hunting, you know, gathering possibly also. But the emphasize, um, you know, even if it's on raising cattle or something like that, more a little more advanced, it's still um, it, it's a certain type of behavior. The term totem is derived, you know, uh, from the and I'm not I don't know how to pronounce all these words. Ajaiba, Juaba. It's a, a Native um, American word for um, I believe it's Native American. It's a native uh, of the Americas, let's put it that way. Um, so the word um, uh, meaning, uh, it's uh, a totemon, meaning one's brother, uh, sister, kin. So the grammatical root of ot uh, signifies blood relation between brothers and sisters who have the same mother and who are not married to each other. <clears throat> in English, the word <clears throat> totem was introduced in 1791 by a British uh, merchant and translator who gave it a false meaning in the belief it was designed, uh, designated the guardian spirit of the individual who appeared in the form of an animal, an idea, in the Ajowa clans did uh, indeed portray um, by wearing uh, an animal skins. And it was reported at the end of the 18th century that uh, the name their clans uh, after those animals that lived in the area by which they lived and appeared to, uh, to either um, friendly or fearful, to be either friendly or fearful. The uh, first uh, articulate report about totemism in North America was written uh, by a Methodist mi missionary, Peter Jones, himself an Ajibwa, um who died uh, in 1856, and whose report was published um, afterwards. So according to Jones, the Great Spirit, which to them... Um, people always think of it as a god, but had been, I don't think it was, not in that sense, uh, had given uh, totemus, totems, to the Ottawa, Ojibwa clans, and because of this act, it should never be forgotten that members of the group are related to one another, and on this account, may not marry among themselves. So it's just showing that, that how this this belief is anis, animist and you know in a sense um, ancestor worship belief you can hear it in that idea totemism is a complex and varied set of ideas and i'm not trying to understand or explain all of them i'm just giving the in a sense the template the outline of the organized uh, how religion you know evolved so there are uh, ideological mystical emotional uh related geological relationships with the social groups or specific persons with animals and natural objects, you know, and the so-called totems. It is necessary, though, to differentiate between group and individual totemism. You know, these forms do share some basic characteristics, but they occur in different emphasis and in different forms in different ways sometimes. So, for instance, people can generally view the totem as a companion, relative, protector, uh, 
um, pejorator and helper ascribed to a superhuman power or abilities to offer some combination of respect, veneration, and or fear. And in most cultures, they use specific names or emblems to refer to the totem. And those sponsors engage in its partial identification with the totem or symbolic assimilation to it. There is usually a prohibition or taboo against killing it, eating it, or touching the totem. But this will vary depending on group. Although totems are often the focus of ritual behavior, it is generally agreed that totemism is not in itself, in a sense, a religion. In a sense, I would agree the same thing. Totemism, in a general way, can be found in a religious expression, but just like animism, in a sense, it's more like um, a persuasion you have than distinctly a religion. So these are, and, and this is true because these are very <laughs> arcane religions, in a sense, or religion expressions. So totemism can uh, certainly include fixed religious elements in varying degrees, just as it can um, appear, you know, uh, connected with the magical thinking. Totemism is frankly mixed with different kinds of other beliefs. Same with animism is why both of these beliefs are almost found throughout all world religions. You know, and these mixtures have historically made uh, the understanding of particular uh, religious uh, evolution confusing, particularly totemistic forms, very difficult, this is including animism uh, as well. And social and collective totemism is the most widely, you know, uh, uh, expressed form of this belief or set of belief systems. So it is typically includes one or more of several features. But remember, it can always be different. But such as a, a mystical association with animal and plant species and natural phenomenon or created objects, which are related uh, to, the, to the, believed to be related, I should say, to the groups, lineage, clans, tribes, uh, moities, um, whatever. Anyways, uh, so with including with or um, in local groups families or the hereditary transmission of totemism um, with your you know paternal or maternal you know group and you know personal names that are based either directly or indirectly on the totem the use of totemistic emblems and or symbols Totemism uh, uh, prohibitions that may apply to specific species, you know, itself or limited to parts of an animal, plants. You see these, you know, parts of an animal in, um, you know, Judaism, you know, where they have kosher and they only can have the front but not the butt in a sense of an animal. Uh, and also the eating of blood, the, 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 the um, taboo of that. Anyways, partial taboos instead of, you know, um, full taboos, you know, uh, are definitely um, a case. And you also have a connection with a large number of animals and natural objects, including, think of this, uh, land. Like, say, the, the land of Israel or something. In a sense, it's like a large totem. It's a large clan-believed, um, or clan-connected uh, belief, you know, complex of ideas you know within the distinction made you know that they're always in a sense the people are linked genetically or something to this totem like the land you know group totems are generally associated and coordinated in the basis of analogies and or basis of myth rituals and just uh, why particular animals are natural things, which sometimes possess, you know, no, in a sense, economic worth or, you know, can't be consumed and used um, in a beneficial way for humans. You know, it may be they originally were selected as totems, you know, often based on some eventful things that happened, some occurrence, 
some moments in time and people's past and then become folklore traditions regarding these nature things, you know, that then become totems and given a sacredness like sacred land, sacred places, sacred people, sacred things. And the origin of society is the question is informative, especially regard to cultural group presuppositions for this thinking of religion. For example, a group that holds a derived, uh, holds to say totemism derived directly from, or indirectly from a given totem may have a tradition in which its progenitor was an animal or plant that could also appear to be a human being. In such belief systems, groups of people and or species and just think of this, do you think that sounds weird, right? That that'd be like like the Moses talking to a burning bush that sometimes and the plant could appear as a human being. Interesting, right? Yeah, so it's a bunch of totemism and animism uh, involved in religions. So anyways, groups of people, species, and plant animal, and plants, animals, thus can have um, pejorators or, you know, champions or whatever, you know, ancestors in common, or even if it's metaphorical, which I am saying that to me, this is the metaphorical ancestor, which then becomes, in a sense, deities, gods, whatever, to me. So, in a sense, um, the, in other cases, though, there are traditions that the human pejorator of a kin group had certain favorable or unfavorable experiences with an animal or natural object or land or whatever, tree. Then, uh, order the descendants respect the whole um, species of plant, animal, place, land, whatever, person. Uh, ancestor, in other words. A group uh, totemism was traditionally common among peoples in Africa, where I believe that original uh, religion originates. India, which it was transferred to. Oceania, especially Malaysia, which it was also transferred um, from Siberia and um, uh, areas like that, and China into it. Anyways. So, uh, and they also are found in North America and parts of South America. Both those to me come from Siberia in a sense, uh, Inner Mongolia, some parts of China, anyways, Japan. Uh, these peoples include, and among others, Australian Aborigines, uh, African uh, Pygmies. These are all pa uh, people that are practicing totemism. So various Native American peoples, uh, and most notably the North uh, West Coast Indians, predominantly the ones that were fishermen, including, not, not limited to, California Indians and the Northwest, in a sense, Indians or Native Americans. And moreover, uh, group totemism is represented in a distinctive form among um, Eurograts and West Siberian hunters, fishermen, who also breed reindeer, including um, that used to be the riding of reindeer. You know, like in Santa Claus. Anyway, so um, as well as uh, among uh, tribes of uh, herdsmen in North and Central Asia, individual totemism is expressed in an intimate relationship or friendship and or protection between the person and the particular animal, thing, natural object, sometimes between a person, species of animal, whatever, um, and it's na or plant, and it's natural object uh, can grant some kind of a special power, believed special power, to its owner. Of course, it's false because there's no such thing in reality. And frequently uh, connected with uh, individual totemism are uh, definite I de ideas about the human soul and or souls of others. And the conceptions, which are not true either, there's no such thing as a soul, connections derived from them. Such as the idea of an alter ego. Um, and not... Nagalism, 
I might probably spell, pronounce that right, from the Spanish form of the Aztec word Nagali, Nuali, whatever it is, uh, something hidden or veiled, which means that a kind of sumptuous existence uh, is assumed between animal, plant, and or natural object, and or person, of course, i.e. a mutual close bond of life and fate exists in some kind of a way. Um, in the case of someone being injured, sickness, death, um, for one in particular, the same fate, you know, in a sense, will befall other members of the person's relationship or the bond of totem. And so you, you would desire to protect or um, feel connected to or responsible for the relationship. Consequently, such totems became most strongly tabooed. Above all, they were connected with family or group leaders, chiefs, medicine men, shamans, and other societally or socially significant persons. Studies of shamanism indicate that individual totemism may have predicated group totemism, as a group's protective spirits were sometimes derived from the totemism of specific individuals' belief spirits. Which, of course, once again, spirits are false. So, um, to some extent, there also exists a tendency to pass on individual totem as hereditary or to make a totem uh, the entire uh, specific animal species to which the individual totem belongs. Individual totemism is widely uh, disseminated and not always um, the same. It is found not only among tribes of hunter-gatherers, harvesters, but also among farmers and herdsmen. Individual totemism is especially emphasized among Australian Aribigenes and American Native Americans or American Indians. Among the um, Wurrajaharo, I don't know how to pronounce this, but it's an Aboriginal people. Uh, traditionally lived, and I'm sorry, I, I bastardized the name, <laughs> lived in New South Wales, Australia. Totemism clans are derived among two subgroups and corresponding material moities. Moities is like, kind of like a totem. The group uh, totem named Flesh is transmitted from the mother. Okay, and in contrast to this, individual totems belong only to the medicine men and are prescribed or passed on uh, paternally. Such an individual totem is named Bala, or, yeah, something, spirit companion, or, here's even a harder one, for me, Jara Sawaba or something. Anyways, I'm sorry. The meat totem that is within him. So there is a strict prohibition against eating the totem. And um, breach of the totem carries with it sickness and or death. It is said to eat your Jarwa Zawaba is the same as if you were to eat your own flesh or that your to, that of your own father. The medicine man um, identifies himself with his personal totem. In general, every offense or injury against a totem or totem has its automatic effect upon the man who commits it supposedly. It is a duty of the totem to guard the ritualist and the medicine man while they or he is asleep. So in the case of danger or arrival of strangers, the animal goes back into the body of the medicine man, supposedly, and informs him of this. Yeah, right. What a, what a joke. Anyways, 
So after the death of the medicine man, the animal, uh, supposedly, stands watch as a bright flickering light near the grave. Yeah, a bright flickering light. Let's see. What does that sound like? Doesn't that sound like fire worship? Doesn't that remind me of the animistic and pre-animistic possible fire worship? Anyways, mentioned that they put flickering light right with, with the spirits of the animal or whatever. The individual totem is also a helper of the medicine man. The medicine man emits the totem in his sleep or in a trance uh, so that he can collect information from him. Supposedly. In this tradition, the sorcerer, or shaman, whatever you want to call him, priest, may also, a practitioner, may also be, uh, or medicine man, by, uh, this may be done by, in a sense, sorcery, may be done, uh, or whatever you want to call it, <laughs> totemistic expression, by, uh, or animus expression, in any sense. Um, by singing, for instance, the medicine man can send uh, uh, out his totem to kill an enemy. It's believed that he can. The totem enters the chest of the enemy and devours its versera, whatever that is. Probably the soul or spear or something. The uh, transmission of the individual totem to novices is done through the father or grandfather. Who, of course, himself already is a shaman, medicine man, practitioner, whatever, something, totemistic, something, leader. Anyways, while um, the coordinate lies on his back, the totem is uh, sung into him, believed to be. The blood relative who is transmitting the totem takes a small animal and places it on the chest of the youngster. During the singing, the animal supposedly sinks slowly into the body and finally disappears into it. Of course, this also could be done with a plant or a symbol of a person or something like, you know, cross or Jesus or comes into you. Yeah, and you ask Jesus into your heart, you know, same way, same mythical, mystical <sighs> bullshit. All right. So, um... The coordinate uh, then uh, is instructed on how he is to treat the animal as his comrade. And he is further instructed in song and a ritual uh, ceremony, you know, that is necessary supposedly to detach the totem from his body. And along the um, North Papua New Guinea um, uh, perennial um, groups um, there is a spread uh, of several uh, over several villages and are associated with animals especially with fish they are believed that they are born from these totems tells you like the birth of myth uh, certainly I think really got going in totemism the beginning of it at least or at least the motivation that it would then give you to myth. And they make um, the totem. Children are given the opportunity to decide during their initiation whether they will res respect the paternal or the maternal totem. So each group of relatives has a holy place, totem place, to which the totem animal brings the souls of the dead and from which the souls of children are also believed to come. So totem animals and or plants or whatever are represented in various manifestations. The spirit the creature is in sacred flutes. Uh, it's also a way that, that this is done. And you see flutes as, as one of the first, a very interesting first, um, Real um, musical instruments, uh, that and a drum, and because um, there, the, there's already at forty thousand, I believe, um, that there's flutes, evidence of flutes. So it is extremely old, and probably relates to all this stuff. Okay, uh, um, 
in disguises, like also the spirit creatures can be um, found. And also, um, it's believed that the manifestation of spirit figures, you know, are pres uh, pres uh, in a sense preserved in each man's house, you know, and. So at the end of the initiation ceremony, the totems are, in a sense, mimicked by the members of the group. And um, this happens in um, uh, Malaysia. Anyways, individual totems have been um, part of the tradition. Particularly persons of the dream of a spirit or ancestor or a dead relative. This spirit appears in a human form, presents him or herself as a helper protector in the names of an animal, plant, so as an object in which he is supposedly manifest, manifested. And um, it is observed by some that uh, manifestations of animals are recognized in the, uh, the behavior or the, the animal's embodiment of their protector spirits. Sometimes members of the tribe also carry with them uh, a particular um, such animal and not only the particular animal but sometimes the whole species is given a due respect uh, as a totem or because of being a totem meals and blood offerings are also presented sometimes to animal spirits or plants young men uh, or trees <laughs> like sacred tree worship Young men who wish to obtain such a uh, protector spirit for themselves sleep on the graves of predominant persons or seek out solitude and uh, fast and don't eat, in other words, so that they may dream of their spirit helper or their helper spirit will come to them because they're basically so malnourished. <laughs> They're hallucinating. Anyways, so uh, actually, only a few persons can name such animals uh, as their very own in totemism. Individual, generally, individuals with protector spirits also uh, attempt to require um, from their descendants the respect and the taboo given the animal representation of that spirit. As a rule, or a general rule, such descendants do not expect special help from the protector spirit, but they observe the totemistic regulations anyway. So, the Burhar, I'm pronouncing it, I'm sure wrong, a people were traditionally regiments um, of the jungle um, in India, and organized into per, uh, perennial um, exorgrams, totem groups. Uh, and so according to one uh, imperfect list, there in general, there's like 37 clans. 12 are based on animals, 10 on plants, and 8 on Hindu um, castes and localities or locations of land. And the rest are on objects. So this just shows that, in a sense, you can't just think of totemism as animals. Some people just do that. It also is plants. It also can be like the Hindu castes, you know, and also localities like land, like I said, sacred places, like, you know, you know the, the land of Israel is special or something, you know, the God's chosen people. That's all it has to do with totemism to me. The totemisms uh, are, totems are passed down within the group. The tales about the uh, uh, tribe's origins are also connected to this, suggesting each totem had, you know, in a sense, this kind of a deep connection with the birth of the ancestor or clan. And um, the Burhor think uh, that a uh, temperamental or physically physical similarity between the members of the clan and their totem occur. Prohibitions or taboos are sometimes cultivated to an extreme degree in regarding eating, killing, or destroying the totem. The clan totems are regarded as if they were actual human members of the group. 
this is the same thing I guess was saying earlier the the thinking now like that that's my God or or you know my, I believe in Jesus and somehow they think of it as a as a member of their actual like family practically even though it's in a sense an extended and um you know this as I understand it the more it's believed that it, there's an offense against the totem you know the more there's a breach to the totem the more the corresponding you know uh uh in a sense response a negative response you know to that harm including you know people can be killed for harming a totem you know if a person comes upon a dead totem animal to the totemist in general they must you know uh smear their forehead with oil or a red dye sounds like the red ochre beliefs of um, animism and you know the oil on the forehead sounds like a lot of religions we have today but he must not actually mourn over the animal he he also or they are also the, the totemists are also um not supposed to bury it generally because it has a specialness that they need to leave it as it is the close and viral relationship between the totem and the clam is shown in a definite uh, ceremony that um, the yearly offered in a definite ceremony offering to the chief spirit in a sense which I think in a sense a chief spirit is almost like a god you know but it's the the archetype that they, then I think becomes it's a chief spirit of the ancestor you know hill and then some, uh, or a uh, place, or animal, or or, or um, land, or mountain. You know, uh, each um, Bohar community has a tradition of an old settlement that is thought to be located on a hill in an area, in the area they're in. Once a year, the men uh, of each clan come together in an open place. The elder of the clan functions as, in a sense, a shaman, priest, a, you know, whatever, um, sorcerer, uh, medicine man, whatever you want to call it, you know, to give the offering. A diagram um, with four sections is drawn. Now, if you think about this, the four sections in a circle reminds me of the medicine wheel, which is then you, you see in a lot of American society um, religious beliefs. So, and they um, draw on the ground with rice flour. One of these, uh, the elder sits while gazing in the direction of the ancestor hill. The emblem is particular totem is placed in one of the other sections of the diagram. Depending on circumstances, this emblem could be a flower, could be a piece of horn, or skin, or wing, or a twig, whatever. This uh, em em emblem represents the clan as a whole to the totemist. If an animal is needed for such a ceremony, it is provided by the members of another clan who do not hold it as a totem. The Burhor show great fear of the spirits in the ancestor hill and avoid these places as far as possible. Among the Kephel people of Liberia, and once again, don't hold me on the name, sorry, there is not only group totemism, but also individual totemism. Both kinds of totemism are referred to various, variously, uh, or different ways. In things like um, things of possession, things of birth, things uh, um, of the black men, or whatever. Anyways, so these um, phrases express the idea that the totem always uh, uh, accompanies, belongs to, and stands behind a guide or a, is a warner of dangers. The totem also uh, pushes the breach. Uh, um, of any taboo um, belief in a sense 
Um, the Capel totems include animals, plants, and natural phenomenon. And uh, the kin groups that live in several villages are maternal at the uh, earlier an earlier time, but during the 20th century, they began to exhibit paternal tendencies. So the group totems, especially animal totems, are concerned as the residents of ancestors. And so to me, this really shows you the connection of ancestor worship and totemism. They are um, replaced and are given offerings. They are respected. Moreover, a great role is played by the individual totems, believed to at least, that in addition to being taboo, there are also given offerings. Personal totems that are animals can be transmitted from father to son, from mother to daughter. Or on the other hand, individual plant totems are assigned at birth or possibly later in some instances. The totem, or totem I mean, also uh, communicates or is believed to communicate magical powers or have magical powers or magical things to communicate. It is even believed possible to alter one's own totem animal. Further, it is considered an alter ego of the person in totemism. So, a person with the same individual totem prefer to be united in communities. The well-known Leopard Confederation, a secret association, seems to have grown out of such desires. Entirely different groups produce paternal taboo communities that are supposedly related by blood. They comprise persons from actually several tribes often. The animals, plants, and actions made taboo by these groups are not considered as totisms sometimes. In a certain respect, the individual totem in this community seems to be the basis of group totemism. So, let's go on further on totemism. Is a belief in spirit-filled and or life after life can be attached to or expressed in things, objects. Then, if you believe this, then you are a hidden totemist. Totemism is approximately 50,000-year-old belief system, though it may be older as there is evidence of what looks like a stone snake or stone serpent in South Africa or Southern Africa, which may be the first human worship, and it dates to around 70,000 years ago, possibly extending to or from the same pre-animism or early arcane animism that the Neanderthals likewise held, and a number of psychologists propose that the Middle Paleolithic societies, such as that of Neanderthals, may have also practiced early forms of totemism, or at least animal worship, in addition to their, you know, previous uh, presumable religious beliefs about the dead. And there's particular um, beliefs that suggest that based on archaeological evidence from Middle Paleolithic caves, that there was widespread or at least believed to be widespread, um, Neanderthal bear cult possibly existed. So animistic cults in the Upper Paleolithic period, such as that of the bear cult, may have had their origins in these hypothetical uh, Middle Paleolithic animal cults of, in a sense, animism, totemism. Um, uh, or I should say, pre-animism, possibly, and pre-totemism. 
And so uh, the animal worship, just like in a said, uh, in a sense, ancestral worship, and, and you have to understand that to them, I don't think they had a real harsh distinction always. That I think sometimes animal worship can be worshipped as a form of ancestral worship, because they saw animals, plants, places as part of their kinship. So, but. Animal worship during the Upper Paleolithic intertwines with hunting rites. I think hunting magic, like what people call things like the Venuses. So, um, for instance, archaeological evidence from art uh, and bear remains reveal that the bear cult apparently had evolved a type of sacrificial bear ceremonialism, or at least it's believed to be so in which the sacrificial bear was shot with arrows or spears and then was finished off by a shot in the lungs and ritualistically buried uh, near a clay bear statue covered in bear fur or believed to be with the skull and body of the bear buried separately. And this definitely is uh, evidenced at least by 100,000 to 50,000 years ago. So, and there also is, by, the, by, by that time too, an increase of the use of red ochre at several Middle Stone Age sites in Africa. Red ochre, I must tell you, is thought to have played an important role in sacred ritual and I would say the evolution of religion. I just call it the red religion because it seems like once red ochre stops, the belief in red being sacred just doesn't really end, even to today. And so uh, to, to assess that there's widespread of this, at 42,000 years ago, there's ritual burials of a man and a, a woman at Lake Mungo, in Australia, the body uh, are sprinkled with copious amounts or lots of red ochre. 40,000 years ago, Upper Paleolithic begins, in a sense, in Europe. An abundance of fossils include elaborate barrels of the dead, with, of course, these so called Venus figures, which I just see as hunting magic, depicting females or fertility, in a sense. And the cave art also involves in use of generally red ochre. And so agrarian uh, figurines, you know, have been found depicting uh, funeral representations of a time and period associated with now extinct animals, including mammoths, rhinos, uh, tarpon, among um, with anthropomorphized depictions that may be interpreted as some of the earliest evidence of this, in a sense, pre-animism, pre-totemism religion, or animism and totem religion itself, depending on how you look at it. And many of the 35,000-year-old animal figurines were discovered uh, in a um, vulgar... Volherd Cave, and I'm once again pronouncing it wrong, in Germany. One of the horses among six tiny mammoths and horse ivory figurines found previously at that same site was a sculpted and uh, skillfully uh, made piece uh, as any piece found thought in the Upper Paleolithic. The body... Um, was a production um, of all the production of ivory beads for body orientation, and important during uh, seemingly important thing during the agrarians uh, population and um, evolution. There are notable absence of uh, painted caves, though there are some evidence of Neanderthal paintings, but very, very, very few. However, it seems to be that. Cave paintings really began with the uh, Solterian um, population explosion. It's a type of uh, peoples, like the agrarians. Uh, Venus, and I'm probably pronouncing these terms wrong too. 
Venus uh, figurines are thought to represent fertility by some people. And like I said, I think that the, the, largely some of the older ones, definitely before paganism, I think it's probably ancestors or some other type of thing, hunting magic, fertility beliefs. The cave paintings at, uh, I'm probably pronouncing it, Chalumet and Lac Cooks, I'm, I'm probably pronouncing these wrong, but anyways, are believed to represent, these are in France, are believed to represent religious thought. The oldest caves found at the cave of El Castillo Terrero in Spain uh, in early uh, agrarian is dated to around 40,000 years ago. The time it is believed that Homo sapiens um, started to really uh, migrate uh, to Europe from Africa. So the paintings at this time mainly represent uh, deer. And the next oldest cave paintings found at uh, Chaluet Cave in France are dating to about 37,000 to 33,000 uh, years ago. And um, then there's a second grouping of like 31,000 to 28,000 years ago. Most of the black drawings are dated to the earlier period. So uh, this cave appears to have been used by humans during obviously two distinct periods. The agrarians and the gravitans. I probably pronounced both those uh, wrong, but those are um, in a sense... Um, it's not names that those people had. It's it's that um, you know archaeology or uh, anthropology is given those names for types of cultures of the, seen in the way that they do behaviors, food, with hunting, whatever you know, um, tools used. Anyways, most of the artwork dates to the earlier agrarian era, thirty uh, two thousand to thirty thousand years ago. Late graviton occupation which occurred from 25 to 27,000 years ago, the paintings feature a large variety of wild animals, such as lions, panthers, bears, hyenas. It is strange to think his animals were roaming around France at this time, but they were. There are no examples of complete uh, human figures in these cave paintings, seeming to symbolize to me that they really hadn't fully anthropomorphized humans, and thus I don't think they really had gods at this point. So and that brings us to shamanism. Shamanism is approximately a 30,000 year old belief system. Shamanism, to me, is a semi-holistic, it's between, I would say, for me, in between animism and totemism. It's like Shamanism is uh, somewhat, I would say, maybe neo-feminine, referring to a new forms of feministic style in nature compared to totemism or animism, tending to go slightly referencing back more to an animistic, other than totemistic, sensibility. Though it has uh, elements definitely of totemism uh, also. Uh, but where shamanism invokes animal images as spirit guides, omens, message bearers, including um, bones or ruins, the, things in nature can be assessed by a shaman who is believed to have sacred access to them, influence over them or in them, and the world uh, of Benevolent and malevolent spirits is, in a sense, access to them or access to humans in general. And most believe spirits existing somewhere on the, in a sense, in a shamanistic sense, they're on the animistic, probably pantheistic sort of a um, spectrum. Not totally gods, but they're uh, becoming more so, generally. Um... They actively pursue contact, though, um, shamans with the spirit world. They, they want altered states of consciousness. You know, they can be done by drugs, drumming, um, sacred plants. Um, whether these plants can be euphoric or hallucinogenic, 
um, you know, singing, um, or say dance, I'm not sure. Anyways, pantheism, you know, just so people can know, is the belief that all reality is identical with divinity in a sense, or God in a sense, or some sort of a power or something force, or that everything composes and all can something uh, is all can encompassing and innately uh, uh, of God in a sense, or deity, or magic, or, or spirit, or something. Anyways, pantheists do not believe in a personal anthropomorphic God and thus hold a more broad-ranging doctrine defining or relating two forms of relationship what they believe is the divinity or reality. Though there's a variety of definitions one could give to pantheism. I'm not saying that shamanism is pantheism. I'm just saying it has these kind of inclinations. Ranging from, you know, theological to more philosophical positions concerning what a god, in a sense, is, could be, or, or, but it's not like a deity generally we think of today, and uh, it, this could be on, the, that they have a different way to approach, in a sense, um, this religious expression of what deity is. Um, it is expressed sometimes, um, though, it, Need, or it needs to be understood that this pantheism is not, in a sense, atheism. Or, so, I'm not saying it would be an impossible for a shaman to be an atheist. It wouldn't. You could be a, both an atheist and a shaman. In other words, you could not believe in God, but you could believe in spirits. I don't think this is reasonable, but it's possible to do this. So, anyways, um, whereas on the other hand, someone could hold that pantheism is a non-religious, to them, philosophical position, more of a metaphorical, like we're talking about right here. A metaphor, or even this one over here, in a sense, is more of a deity than this one. This is less, more metaphor, less metaphor, in a sense, you know, becoming more anthropomorphic. Uh, so, uh, you have the, this new kind of a change. You know, to them, in a sense, according to, you know, world pantheistic movement, scientific, Scientific pantheism is the only form of spirituality that they know of and which fully embraces science as a part of the human exploration of Earth and the cosmos. Yeah, whatever. Sounds like a bunch of nonsense. Anyways, and such pantheism in general may hold the view that the universe, in the sense of totality of existence of reality, and God are identical implying a denial of the personality or transcendence of these gods. They assert that scientific pantheism re, uh, re, <clears throat> rejects the... <clears throat> sorry. Pantheism respects the rights not just of humans, but of all living beings. It focuses on saving the planet, in a sense, more than trying to, in a sense, save souls. Because to them, there would be a very little difference, in a sense. Souls are people. People are the world, or whatever. God is the world. Anyways, so to them, uh, it, is, uh, and it encourages you to make the most... I'm not saying this is everybody. This is just some people that are this way. Uh, make a most of the best of what your one life is here. Uh, so it values reason in a sense that, that I'm talking about scientific pantheism to the pantheistic society or whatever. So you can see where it moves beyond for them the term God and defines uh, self as possibilities and reality. Whatever. I don't believe in it. But anyways, it's showing you the different kind of thinking you can have uh, on what a deity is in a sense. Shamanism may have something like deities though they tend to be more like pantheism or metaphorical deism, sort of, polytheism. Deism is a philosophical position uh, that posts that gods, or in some God, or in some sense gods, do not interfere directly with the world. Conversely, it can also be stated as a system of belief which posts God's existence as the cause of all things and admits that 
his perfection and usually existence of natural law or providence, but then rejects divine revelation or direct intervention of God in the universe by things like miracles. They reject that. It also rejects revelation as a source of religious knowledge, asserting, deists do, that reason and observation of the natural world are sufficient to determine the existence of a single creator and our absolute principle of the universe as being created. I would disagree. That's Science shows that not to be the case. So, shamanism may um, have many supernatural beings, both animal humanism, like found in animism, with their animal deities are common, but more anthropomorphic ones that are more human-like and have a different level of belief power. Anthropomorphic human-like ones can be both somewhat personal and uh, uh, and um, somewhat non-personable, with a shared metaphorical ancestor, grandmother, grandfather, great-grandmother, grandfather. So, deism type of, you know, metaphoric deism, polytheism, metaphoric polytheism, or some kind of thing like that, sort of. But not exactly the generally we think of gods, and not as much of what we think about gods today, certainly, uh, in general. The, also understand that shamanism, like the one-eyed um, being closed or damaged or something to the eyes, that you see uh, as a, kind of an archetype for pre-anism with the Homo erectus stones they gathered, the wounded healer is also an archetype of the shaman crisis, a rite of passage for shamans to be or, or to become a shaman commonly involving a physical illness that pushes them to the brink of death, thought to give them access to the spirit world, and or psychological crisis or physical damage, deformity, or abnormality that they have to endure or deal with. And especially the eyes, because it's believed when your eyes are damaged that you then can see into the other worlds, because you can't see this one. Anyways, my art um, up here of the bird... Um, could be a chicken and the snake can be viewed as dangerous or useful um, uh, but animals are sacralized even including animals as sacrificed and used in shaman and rituals you can tell there's evidence of, of sacrificial shamanistic use of animals that's at least 5,000 years old so shamanist is the belief in spirit-filled life and or afterlife can be attached to or expressed in things like objects and or used in special, by special persons and or through rituals to connect to the spirit-filled world of life or afterlife. If you believe this, you are a hidden shamanist. An approximately 30,000-year-old belief system. There is some, There is what is believed to be a female shaman burial with uh, matching carved ivory head of the Polvolin culture, uh, or probably uh, dating to about 30,000 to 25,000 years ago. It's a variant of the Gravidin culture, which is generally thought to be about 33 to 22,000 years ago. And dated uh, um, to uh, 29,025, an old uh, Delaunay Venois, Vestinois, Venice, Nice, Anyways, I can't pronounce it. Anyways, in the Czech Republic. <laughs> um, so, carved ivory figure, shape of a female head, was discovered near huts. The left side of the uh, figure's female figure's face was distorted. It is believed to be a, a depiction of an elder female's burial, possibly a woman of 40, 40 years old. She was ritualistically placed between, or sorry, beneath a pair of mammoth scapula. One learning leaning against 
the other side. Surprisingly, the left side of the skull was disfigured in the same manner as the carved ivory figure, indicating that the figure was an intentional depiction of a specific individual, this woman, who was um, believed to be uh, a shaman. So the bones and the earth surrounding the body contain traces of red ochre. A flint spearhead had been placed near her skull, and one hand held the body of a fox. This evidence suggests that this burial was believed to be the site of a shaman. This would be the oldest site, not only of a ceramic figurine and artistic uh, portrait, but also evidence of the female shamans. So women were much more prominent in religion before 5,500 years ago. A lot of people don't realize this, but archaeologists usually describe two regional variants of the uh, Western Graviton, known namely at sites and caves in France, Spain, Britain, and Eastern Graviton with Central Europe and Russia. The Eastern Gravitons uh, include the Pavlonian culture, um, were specialized mammoth hunters whose remains are usually found not in caves but in open air sites. The origin of the Graviton people is not clear. They seem to have appeared simultaneously all over Europe. Though they carry distinct genetic signatures, gravitons, gravitons, and agrarians before them were descended from the same ancient founding population, according to genetic data, of at least 37,000 years ago. In a sense, all Europeans can be traced back to a single founding population that made it through the last ice age. Furthermore, the so-called founding fathers of this set were part of the agrarian culture which had displaced another group of early humans that it was uh, by the members of the Graviton culture between 37,000 and 14,000 years ago. So different groups of Europeans were descended from a single founding population in general, to a greater extent than their agrarian predecessors. They are known especially for their Venus or Goddess figurine creations. Now we go on to paganism, an approximately 12,000 year old belief system. And if you notice, we are starting to get all kinds of stuff up there in our belief system. And the, the, the you're moving to the polytheism. So defining paganism, though, is kind of problematic. Understanding that the context is associated and its terminology is important in how I'm using it. Everybody can use it differently. But in general, to me, paganism roughly, you know, emerged around or after 13,000 years ago or generally around that time with the emergence of agriculture explosion in Turkey or Antinola. And the connected areas, such as the Levant, um, described as a crossroads of Western Asia and Eastern Mediterranean and Northern Africa, and the northwest of the Albanian uh, plain, including Cyprus, Israel, Iraq, Jordan, or Arabian plain, excuse me including Cyprus, Israel, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, Palestine, Syria, and Turkey. Specifically, Turkey is a nation uh, straddling Eastern Europe and Western Asia with cultural connections to ancient Greeks, Persians, Romans, Byzantine, and Ottoman empires. But getting back to it, Paganism is a part of a link group of religious thinking 
seeming to turn the once believed animistic spirits, a belief dating back at least 100,000 years ago on the continent of Africa, with that of totemism, dating back at least 50,000 years ago, basically to the continent of Europe, though possibly starting in Africa, and with newly um, perceived needs where um, given artistic expression of animistic spirits, both animal or human, seemingly focused more on female humans to begin with. And only much, much later is there what looks like could have been added in male focus. But even this evolved into believe stronger communication with more connections and shamanism, a belief system dating back 30,000 years ago on the continent of Asia or Siberia, Inner Mongolia, something, but likely Siberia, with uh, newly perceived needs then, uh, um, or, that are, were obviously different in Europe than in Africa. You, you start to have a need for, in a sense, different thinking because you have different needs. So I think that the evolution of religion is somewhat based on just geography, like where you go, what's needed there, what's there, and it affects how you think. Like, you don't have, in a sense, volcanoes in a, um, religions where there's no volcanoes. So anyways, um, like you wouldn't have a bear belief system for if there was no bears. <laughs> it would be something else. Okay, um, with these newly perceived needs, though, it then evolves into, I think, uh, in our culture and Sedanism, which is about the same time, about 12, 13,000 years ago, paganism, a belief system that dates, I think, somewhere around, you know, 12, 13,000 years ago. You know, um, on the continent of uh, Eastern Europe, Europe, in Western Asia, especially Turkey, mainly. But also uh, into the Eastern Mediterranean, the Levant, as well as some extent or another. With newly perceived needs, though, you have the emergence of these animal and female goddesses. Um, around this time, it turned into more formalized animal gods and animal goddesses. And it feels like to me that only after around 7,000 to 6,000 do male gods emerge into the picture showing a link of its evolution of religion. And the other um, stuff is more on a historical religion from that point. And, and well, because you start to have writing, especially. And um, there's all kinds of stuff that we need to understand is um, that folk, uh, folk religion, in a sense, often, or ethnic indigenous religion can be sometimes thought of as either animistic, um, totemistic, shamanistic, paganistic. It's kind of, it, it, you don't totally know which of those, but it's probably one of those. So um, we have to understand, like, how do we get to this thinking? Well, early Christians referred to uh, the diverse array of cults around them as a single group for reasons of convenience or rhetoric. While most pagan religions expressed a worldview that was um, at least pantheistic, polytheistic, or animistic, there are also some, uh, but not very many, uh, in a sense, monotheistic pagans. Okay, while paganism generally implies polytheism to some kind, kind or amount, the um, primary distinction between classical pagans and what Christians um, was not that of monotheistic versus polytheistic. Not all pagans were strictly polytheistic. Though, uh, throughout history, many uh, um, of them believed in a supreme uh, deity. However, most such pagans believed in the class of subordinate gods or demon spirits, whatever, which is considered to, like I see as uh, henotheism, um, which is the, in a sense uh, the belief in a god without the rejection of other gods or divine, um, you know, beings or something. Paganism traditionally encompasses the collective pre and non-Christian 
cultures around the classical world, including those of Greco-Roman, Celtic, Germanic, Slavic tribes. However, the modern prevalence of folklorists and contemporary so-called pagans, neo-pagans, in particular, has extended into religion and um, to more of a definite scopes than just early humans. I mean, early Christians, you know, would have included. So actually, paganism to me really goes uh, traditions in a sense stretch far into prehistory. Paganists believe in a sense in spirit-filled uh, life and or afterlife can be a. Uh, uh, attached to or be expressed in things, objects. These objects can be used by special persons in special rituals, can connect to spirit-filled life or afterlife, who are guided, supported by a god, goddess, um, goddesses, gods. Um, if you believe this, you are a hidden paganist. And paganism is at least approximately 12,000-year-old belief system. And we have some evidence of this in Golpekli Tepe, which is the first human temple, which is dates to about that time, as well as Cattle Hook, which is the first re religious designed city, which is about 10,000, 9,000 years old. And there's all, um, both have evidence of some kind of early paganism to me. Early paganism is connected to what I think of as the Proto-Indo-European language and our religion. Proto-Indo-European religion can be somewhat reconstructed um, with some level of confidence that what the so somewhat general position on the gods, goddesses, myths, festivals, and form of rituals, and invocations, prayers, songs, praises that make up the spoken elements of these religions. Much of this actively is concerned with nat the natural agricultural year. Or at least those are the earliest elements that can be reconstructed because nature does not, in a sense, change because farmers are the most uh, conservative members of society in this sense and are the best able to keep the old ways because, in a sense, it's a practice of the you know digging into the ground and planting something. It's not that different than the first time that that was done, in a sense. So. It, in a sense, that kind of a, they, in a sense, a farmer in a in a larger you know you know sense is keeping the old ways of this agricultural type of thinking. But anyways, goddesses, you know, um, these there are at least forty de uh, deities. Uh, although uh, gods can be differentiated in many ways and can be thought to uh, evolve um, into ways that they can be known such as how a deity's gender may not be fixed characteristic, especially for early deities, since they are very often uh, defined as forces of nature, which uh, tended to not, in a sense, have some sort of fixed gender. In other words, like you could have, and also we have to understand is they, they, they did worship other genders, as in even in, uh, intersex or homorphodites, there's some um, actual carvings of figurines where they made figurines of homorphodites or intersex individuals who are not specifically male and or female. Um, anyways, uh, among the goddesses um, that, that they can reconstruct in a sense so far from the Indo-European, um, Proto-Indo-European religion or whatever, um, are, uh, I'm, I'm once again can't pronounce these good, but Priya, Paleo, Diva, I don't even want to continue these, and Yama, whatever. Anyways, these are, there's a couple other ones, at, er, I, I can't pronounce words, <laughs> names. Anyways, there are at least 28 myths that can be reconstructed to Proto-Indo-European. Many of these myths have since been confirmed by additional research including some in areas which are not accessible to the early writers, such as the Levian folk songs and Hittite um, hieroglyphic tablets. So both these are from Turkey, by the way. Okay, so one of the most widely recognized myths in the Indo-European myth is the Yama. 
um, which is killed by his brother, Manu. And the world is made from his body. Some forms of this myth of various Indo-European languages are given um, as creation myths for European Indo-Europeans. The Proto-Indo-European or Pi people are estimated to have spoken uh, a single language from at least about 6,500 years ago. This goes to, attaches to what's considered the Kurgan hypothesis relating to the construction of Kurgan or mound grave graves. The earliest Kurgan mound graves date to about 6,000 years ago in the uh, Cossacks and are associated with Indo-Europeans. Kurgans were built in the uh, uh, early times, antiquity, and Bronze Age, Iron Age, uh, the Neolithic, uh, the Middle Ages, and ancient traditions still active in some southern Siberian or central uh, Siberian today. Kurgan cultures are derived archaeologically mainly into different uh, subcultures, such as timber graves pit grave, Scythian graves, and Samaritan graves, Hutchin graves, and Kumam Kipak graves. Kurgan barrows were characteristic of Bronze Age peoples in a general way and have been found from the Altai Mountains in um, basically Siberia and on Inner Mongolia and the Cossacks, Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria, Kurgans were used in uh, Ukraine and Russian steppes. Their use spreading with the migration into Eastern, Central, and Northern Europe around 5,000 years ago. Burial mounds were complex structures with integral chambers, with burial chambers at the heart of the Kurgan. Kind of like when you think of Pyramids, like in the Egyptians. So, uh, they're generally, these were Pergans almost in pyramid or at least um, pointed in a sort of, you know, structures buried under the ground. Anyways, elite individuals generally. Elite individuals are buried with grave goods and uh, sacrificial offerings, sometimes including things later, like uh, horses and chariots, especially with the Scythians. The structures of the early... Uh, Neolithic period from the 4th to the 3rd, third millenniums uh, BC and the Bronze Age until the 1st millennium BC display continuity in the uh, architect uh, forming and methods showing that there is a connection. So in other words, say it differently, sort of, so you have basically from 6,000 years until um, basically 2,000 years ago, you have a continuity in how these, these things were, were made. So um, they were inspired um, by common uh, ritual um, methodological ideas, mythological ideas. Whereas the Antinola hypothesis suggests that the speakers pre-Proto-Indo-Europeans um, to the Proto-Indo-Europeans lived in Atnola during the Neolithic era, era and is associated with the dis distribution of the later historical Indo-European languages with the expansion during the Neolithic um, agricultural revolution that spread out about 9,000 years ago carrying what I believe was its early pre-paganism um, beliefs or paganism beliefs with it. With a proposed homeland of the Proto-Indo-European uh, proper in the Balkans around 7,000 years ago, which um, might be identified as old European culture by some. This hypothesis states that Indo-European languages began to spread peaceably 
by a dramatic diffusion into Europe from Asia Minor or Turkey or Antinola. Um, the Neolithic advance of farming, wave of advance of agricultural revolution and agricultural religion, According to most of its inhabitants, in a sense, the Neolithic Europe would have spoken some form of Indo-European languages, and later migrations would have replaced the Indo-European variants with other Indo-European variants. The expansion of agriculture, and thus agricultural religion, from the Middle East would have diffused three language families, Indo-European, towards Europe, uh, De Devardian towards Pakistan and India, and Afro-Asiatic towards Arabia and North Africa. Reconstructions of the Bronze Age Pi society based on vocabulary items like the wheel do not necessarily hold for Antinola branch which appears to have separated at an earlier stage prior to the invention of wheeled vehicles. Proto-Indo-European religion seems to stretch back at least the 6,000 years ago, but as I presume, likely further back, possibly 12,000 to 13,000 years ago. Now we move on to progressed organized religion, which starts about 5,000 years ago. And where we get the big daddy in the sky and the little demons, devils, devil and the God. Okay, so progress organized religion starts to me in approximately 5,000 year old belief system. And is it 5,000 year old belief system? This uh, was a time of astonishing creativity as city states and empires emerged as a vast stretch of the Mediterranean and into Indus Valley. The previous millennium had seen the emergence of advanced urbanized civilizations. New bronze metallurging extended the productivity of agricultural work and highly developed ways of communication through language and written form of writing. In the third millennium, or about 5,000 years ago, the growth of these riches, both intellectually and physically, became a source of connection on a political stage. The rulers sought out the accumulation of more and more wealth and power and religion as a way to accomplish this aim. Among, along with this came the first appearance of the mega-architecture, in, uh, imperialism in a sense, organized absolutism, and internal revolution. The civilizations of Sumer and Akkad in Mesopotamia became a collection of volatile city-states, which all had in a sense their city god, in which warfare was common. Uh, uninterrupted conflicts uh, drained all available resources, energies, and killed off populations. In this millennium, large, enterprise, large uh, empires succeeded, you know, and lasted and, and became conquerors, grew in stature until the, uh, the so-called great uh, Sargon or Ar Sargon the Great of Akkad, or Akkad, whatever I don't pronounce it, pushed his empire into the whole of Mesopotamia and beyond. This is also after the Egyptian already did stuff like that. It um, would not be uh, surpassed until uh, since Assyrian times, um, about fifteen uh, hundred years later. In the Old Kingdom of Egypt, though, Egyptian pyramids were constructed and would remain the tallest and largest human constructions for thousands of years. Human, um, also in Egypt, pharaohs began to posture themselves as so-called living gods or sons of the god. 
made of the essence different from all other human beings. Even in Europe, which was uh, still largely in the Neolithic during the same period, the builders of megaliths were constructed giant monuments on their own without the same uh, influential um, imperialist societies, or at least I don't believe so. In the Near East and the Orient around 5,000 years ago, the, and religion um, was allowed to develop and advance in a very um, forced way through this imperialization of religion and state control of religion. Roughly the ways um, we are somewhat familiar with to a large amount now. Uh, limits were being uh, pushed by architecture and rulers bent on religious and power. Towards the close of the millennium, Egyptian became, or Egypt became the stage of the first populous, uh, popular revolution recorded in history. Uh, after lengthy wars, the uh, uh, Sumerians recognized the benefit of unification into a stable national government and became relatively peaceful, well-organized. Uh, and this complex um, of state um, is basically um, the third dynasty of Ur, which is in Mesopotamia. So the destiny, uh, the dynasty, was later uh, to become involved with the way of um, nomadic uh, invaders known as the Amorites, who were to play a major role in the religion, uh, in the region, uh, sorry, also religion, during the following centuries. In the Near East and the Orient, during around 5,000 years ago, the region developed and advanced into roughly ways we somewhat are familiar with. Limits to things are, are, are somewhat the same. Or I mean, sorry, somewhat the same. So, um, these Amorites uh, invaders, who were to um, play a major role, uh, you really have to look at the, the case of 5,750 years ago, um, the proto-Semitic peoples emerged from generally um, uh, in the area of the Levant, which is Israel, Palestine, Syria. Uh, anyways, proto-Semitic peoples would migrate through the Near East into Mesopotamia, Egypt, Ethiopia and eastern shores of the Mediterranean and so seven uh, um, 5,700 years ago you know in the Indus Valley which is India um, started to have a port city of trade 5,650 uh, years ago the Minoan culture appeared in Crete and they actually tie back to uh, leaving Turkey DNA-wise, I think about 9,100 years ago. So 5,500 years ago is the birth of the state to me, the rise of hierarchy and the fall of women's status. As, and then you have by 5,300, the, the Indus Valley civilization was a Bronze Age civilization. You know, and um, this is in the northwestern uh, region of India, and the subcontinent, also parts of um, Pakistan, maybe a little bit of Afghanistan. And it's noted for its um, cities built of brick, roadside um, drainage system, multi-storied ho multi houses, as well as creating artifacts that could be linked to pre-Vedic religions by this time. 5,200 years ago, Hellenistic culture and uh, Catalytic culture both emerged in Greece. 5,102 years ago was the beginning of the Kaliyuga, I don't know how to pronounce it right, a new age among the followers of Indian religions. Uh, Kali, Kali Yoga, Yauga or something, anyways. 5,100 years ago is the initial form of uh, in the sense of Stonehenge was completed. It was circular banks with ditches enclosed about 110 meters 
or 360 feet across and may have been completed um, with a timber circle. 5,100 years ago, um, there is uh, basically a um, 2,500 uh, ton passage tomb uh, aligned to the winter solstice in Ireland 5,000 uh, years ago is a unification of Upper and Lower Egypt, and thus the first in a sense real um, uh, empire or uh, country state in a sense. So 5,000 years ago is the first evidence of gold being used in the Middle East. 5,000 years ago, there's vessels found in Denmark. 5,000 years ago is the invention of uh, Sumerian crudiform, emerged from proto-illiterate Yurk period, allowing for the uh, codification of beliefs and creation of detailed historical records, including religious records. 5,000 years ago is the second phase of Stonehenge was completed and appears to have functioned as a first enclosed ceremonial ceremony in the British Isles, or one of them. 4,900 years ago, beginning of the early diagnostic period, uh, one in Sumer. 4,900 years ago, it's the Sumerian pictographs involved uh, into uh, phonograms. 4,900 years ago, Mesopotamian wars of the early diagnostic period. 4,900 years ago, volume statues Voltal statues from the square temple um, in Iraq were made. Uh, 4,900 years ago, Syria, the foundation of the city of Mari. 4,900 years ago, Semitic tribes occupied Assyria in northern parts of the plain of Shinar and Akkad. 4,900 years ago, Phoenicians settled on the Syrian coast with the centers of Trey and Sidon. 4,900 years ago, the beginning of the periods of sagas of kings of China, also known as the three sovereigns and the five emperors. 4,900 years ago, the ziggurats were created, multi-platform um, temples, um, and similar to the pyramids, which are multi-platform tombs, which are 4,700 years old. 4,879 years ago was the rise of the Van Lang Kingdom and the Hong Bang Dynasty in northern Vietnam. 4,874 years ago, the 300 and 65-day calendar, um, year calendar was installed in an ancient in ancient Egypt. 4,852 years ago is the beginning of the period of the three um, August ones and the five emperors in China. Um, 4,832 years ago is estimated germination of the Methuselah tree, the oldest known living organism. 4,807 years ago is the suggested date for an asteroid or comet impact between Africa and Antarctica around the same time as a solar eclipse on May 10th based on the analysis of flood stories possibly causing the Berkey Crater and the Lance Symboy Chevron. Um, once again, I, I can't pronounce these words. Anyways, so 4,800 years ago, and Ur becomes one of the richest cities in Sumer. 4,800 years ago, uh, Harp uh, player from Kenosis um, was made now at the Metropolitan Museum of New York 
4,800 years ago in Iran, the creation of the kingdom of Elam. 4,800 years ago, a seated harp player... Um, I already read that. Uh, so 4,775 years ago was the second dynasty wars in ancient Egypt. So anyways, 4,000... Uh, 750 years ago, the end of the early diagnostic one period and the beginning of the early diagnostic two period in Mesopotamia. Anyways, you, you, uh, uh, by 4,750, okay, we have estimated ending of the, um, the one culture um, in the region of modern day Romania, Moldova, and Ukraine, and invention of a new. So by you see, but right around the same time, you know all all this stuff is is occurring. So even at um, if you look at four thousand six hundred and seventy, I'm sorry, ninety seven years ago, the Yellow Emperor starts to reign in China. Four thousand six hundred and eighty five years ago, the Bull of Ire. From the tomb of the Queen Pabui of uh, Ur, uh, modern day uh, rock was made. Anyways, you start to see this 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 stuff, and the, just like um, 4,640 years ago, the cultivation and weaving of silk starts to uh, be guarded as secret in China. Anyways, I can go on and on and on about stuff, but you can start to see a real. Uh, um, emergence happens and even in India 4,600 years ago there's a maturing of the Harpen phase of the Indus Valley civilization begin city states of Harpen and uh, Mahanjodaro um, become large metropolitan civilizations expanding over to over 2,500 cities and settlements across Pakistan and northern India Afghanistan, parts of Iran, and uh, covering a region of around 1 million square miles. A land area larger that comprises Egypt and Mesopotamia combined. Anyways, so uh, that brings you back to again, just real quick. I'll run through it. Animism, totemism, shamanism, paganism, and progress organized religion. Thank you for joining me in this. And... Um, I would just say that, let's go through it again, animism is approximately a 100,000 year old belief system, totemism is approximately 50,000 year old belief system, shamanism is approximately 30,000 year old belief system, paganism is approximately 12,000 year old belief system, and progressed organized religion is around 5,000 years ago. So. Religion needs to be understood is not special. It is a human made product. It is dogmatic propaganda. So forget religion's unfounded myths. I have substantiated archaeological facts. The earliest hints of symbolic superstition begins, behaviors begin to be seen about one million years ago. Primal superstition increases about 600,000 years ago to a greater extent around 300,000 years ago, which is what I call pre -anism. The earliest superstitionized or secularizing behaviors can be seen around 100,000 years ago for humans or animism. Clearly behaviors around 70,000 years or less, progressing around 50,000 years ago to what I call totemism. And finally, around 13,000 years ago, with paganism, begins the evolution of progress organized religion, further developing around 10,000 years ago, finally becoming more progressed around 7,500 years ago to 5,000 years ago, forming into the mythology and its connected sets of dogmatic propaganda. So let me be clear as I can all religions and the theorized deities or supernatural elements they support are but a spectrum of accepted unfounded myths lies or 
institutionalized superstition as well as some amount of bundling, grouping of pseudoscience, pseudohistory, and pseudomorality, which is why I believe they are inherently need to be deconstructed, devalued, and I really feel like they need to be reset where they belong. They are myth, not reality. Therefore, there is no denying religion and its faithism, no matter how loved some may be, are profound untruths, or at least that's how I see them, as just a connected set of dogmatic propaganda. And I thank you for your time, and bye-bye.